today I want to talk to you about a very important subject, what to do about besetting sin in your life. Every Christian struggles against sin. None of us are perfect. The Bible shows us that even the great men of God had to learn self-control over sin. We have a sinful nature from birth, and Satan uses that to his advantage to get us away from God. I want to tell you about two men in the Bible who were some of the greatest men in the Bible on planet Earth. Um, all of them, both of them, wrote vast sections of the Scripture, and yet both of them struggled with deep sin. The first was the Apostle Paul. Uh, he wrote much of the New Testament, but he struggled with covetousness. He tells us his testimony in Romans 7, starting in verse 7. The Apostle Paul told us, well then, I am suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting was wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the command to kill me, but still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation and death. So we can see how the terrible sin really is. It used God's good commands for its own evil purpose. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. In verse 24, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Now, in this passage, the Apostle Paul is telling us a problem that we all have. Uh, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've realized that your sinful nature um, shows itself all too often. Uh, your sinful nature has certain sins that give you joy, give you pleasure, give you satisfaction. And you read in the Bible that it's wrong, and because it gives you some pleasure or you feel you have a need for it, uh, Satan puts it in your mind through deceit that this is something that you need and you can justify it because you have this inward desire for it. And so Paul is saying, this sin that you're doing, even though it gives you pleasure, it is condemned by God. Sin, according to God in the Bible, is breaking his law. The speed limit on the highway is what it is, maybe 30 kilometers an hour. If you're going 60 on that road, you're breaking the law. The speed limit sign 60, uh, 50 of uh, 30 cannot control you. You've got a free will. You can, you can obey it or not obey it. When God tells you not to sin, that's the law. If you don't obey that, you've broken his law. He says if you broke his law, the penalty is not money. The penalty is forever separated from God in the fires of hell. That's how serious this is. Your besetting sin separates you from God until you confess it. Your sins have separated between you and your God, he tells us. So you're out of fellowship with God when you do your besetting sin. So here's the struggle. In Paul's case, it was covetousness. In your case, it may be something entirely different. We're all different and different struggles in our body, different ways that we are, are pulled by Satan's trickery. Yet in Romans 8, 1, um, the Apostle Paul said, as Christians, we are not condemned 
Romans 8, 1 and 2. So now, there is no condemnation to those who belong to Jesus Christ. Being condemned here means that at the great judgment, at the end of the world, every one of us will stand before God in the judgment. Jesus Christ is the judge. He's sitting on the judgment throne. The book of your history of your life is opened. He reads out publicly everything you've done, every sin you've committed. Everybody knows about it, even the secret sins. And he condemns you. He says, you've broken my law. Down you go. Depart from me, he says, into everlasting fire, condemned with Satan and the devils that follow him, Hitler and these kind of evil people. He says, at that judgment, you as a Christian person are not condemned. He's not going to make that judgment against you or me. Because it says in verse 2, because you belong to him, to Jesus, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Next week, we'll study about that power, how you can appropriate that power in your life, the power of the resurrection. That's what Paul wanted to know. He said, oh, that I might know Christ in the power of his resurrection. So there is more to the Christian life than you're experiencing now. There's something new that you can learn the power of the resurrection. So you have to come back next week to learn about that. Jesus pleads our case before the Father. In 1 John 2, 1 and 2, uh, we read, My dear children, he, he's, he's talking affectionately. He's not condemning us. He calls us dear children. He's talking to all of us. I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. Uh, it's impossible not to sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. That's a, somebody to defend us, somebody to stand up for us, somebody to, to help us, a lawyer, an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous, and he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sin. When you or I sin and we confess it before God, Jesus Christ is standing before God and he's saying to God the Father, look, Here's the nail prints in my hands and in my side and in my feet. I went to the cross and I paid for this person's sin. Here's my blood on the altar in heaven, the eternal altar. I gave my blood to forgive their sin. I bore their sin in my body. Please forgive them. Immediately you are forgiven. Immediately you are cleansed like you didn't do it, like you're a newborn baby. Positionally, God sees every one of us in the place of Jesus Christ. Positionally, we are perfect, sinless. He presents us sinless before God the Father, Jude tells us. Practically, we're not. Practically, we're trying to work out our, our sinlessness. We work on it. We find ourselves sinning, and we stop it. We pray, God, help me. I need your power. God, please strengthen me. Make it to where I can be like Jesus Christ. And we take steps. We're moving in the right direction, but we still make mistakes. We still make sins. But God loves us. And we plead the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are cleansed and forgiven. So Paul teaches us that strong Christians sin daily. However, they are forgiven and cleansed when they confess their sin. 1 John 1, 9, 8, and 9, if we claim we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. You think you're sinless? God says you're telling a lie. Every one of us, except Jesus, he's the only perfect one. All of us sin. All of us have broken God's law in one way or another. None of us are perfect. We're moving in the right direction as Christians, but we still have that sin, that breaking of the law that we've done in one way or another. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins to him, you don't need to confess them to a priest. You confess them directly in your heart to God Almighty. You tell him what you've done. Uh, when I first started practicing this, I felt ashamed to admit what I was doing wrong. And then I realized, well, God knows it anyway. He sees everything you do. He knows everything in your heart. Tell him exactly what you've done, exactly how you feel, your covetousness or whatever it is. Own up to it on your knees privately before God. Confess your sins. He is faithful. means he will do it. He is just. It means he can do it because he died for you to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all wickedness. So you're your confession means that you restore the fellowship. Your sins have separated between you and your God, but when you confess it, you get forgiven and cleansed, and the fellowship is again connected to God. You're his child. He loves you. 
He wants you to confess your sins so that he can have fellowship with you. He wants to be with you constantly. He wants each one of us to practice his presence. If you remind yourself of his presence with you, it'll deter sin from your heart. You'll realize God doesn't want you to do that. It's like if you have a five-year-old child and you have something important on the coffee table and you say to your child, you can touch anything in this room, but don't touch that. And you leave the room and you look through the keyhole, what's that child going to do? Break your law. The first thing they're going to do is go touch that thing you said not to touch. That's what all of us do. God says, don't do something. To God, to Paul, he said, don't covet. And as soon as he said, don't covet, then Paul started, well, I'm going to covet. And that's what we do. So we, we break God's laws, and God says, that damns us. But Jesus forgives us. Um, we must use the power of the resurrection to overcome sin. So next week, we'll learn more about that. The second man I want to tell you about is David. He was a very strong Christian. David wrote many of the precious psalms that we read in the, in the psalms. The psalms are vertical, they say, theologians say. They, they tell us about our relationship to God. Proverbs is horizontal. It tells you how to get along with other people. Um, you should read a psalm every day and a proverb every day. Learn how to get along and love people. Learn how to get along and love God. So, David loved God, and God loved David. In Acts 13, 22, it tells us God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. That's what a man after God's heart does. He understands what God wants, and he directs himself to learn to do that. I hope that I can learn to be a fully a man after God's own heart. God's heart is pure, it's righteous, it's good, it's kind, it's loving, it's gentle, it's not angry. It's when well, he's angry at sin, but he's not angry at us. He loves us. And if we have a heart after God, we're going to be like Jesus Christ. We're going to learn to be that way. So David gave into human passion and sinned big time with adultery and murder. We have the story of his sin and his downfall, his besetting sins. In 2 Samuel 11, starting in verse 2, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. He looked over the city, and he noticed a woman, unusual beauty, taking a bath. David was wrong from the get-go. His army was out fighting in the war. He was home resting. He was sleeping while his soldiers are out there fighting. He was supposed to be commanding his troops and winning the war of the enemies of God that were trying to overtake his country. He was absent AWOL, absent without leave. He wakes up from bed, stretches, walks on the roof of his house, which is flat, looks over the city. He hears splashing of water. He looks. The Bible says there were three women in the Bible that are said to be very beautiful. Bathsheba, who he was looking at, was one of these women. She's not completely innocent. What was she doing taking a bath in public, singing or something, splashing water? David saw her. Verse 3, he sent someone to find out who she was. He was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Who was Uriah the Hittite? Uriah was one of the crack troops of, the, of, the, of Israel. America has crack troops, Green Berets and others. Uh, we have one of our brothers with us today who was one of the elite soldiers in the American military. Came here to help the Georgian government understand more about sophisticated equipment and other things that are secret things. This man who married this Bathsheba was one of the elite troops, one of David's good fighting men, smart, dedicated, good soldier. When David heard who he was, verse 4, David sent messages to get her, to get Bathsheba, this man's wife. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. 
Then she returned home. This was not a rape. She wanted this. She was participating in this. What was she doing having this bath in public anyway in the first place? Verse 5, later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I am pregnant. Uh-oh. Big problem. Then David sent word to Joab. Joab was the commander of his troops. Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked him how Joab and the army was getting along and down and the war was progressing. Uh, Uriah told him... Uh, uh, but then he told Uriah, go home now and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. What was David doing? He was trying to cover up his sin. He thought if Uriah would go home and sleep with his wife, the baby could be said to be Uriah's child. So he was covering up or trying to cover up what he did. But Uriah was a lawyer, loyal soldier man. And he said, all of my buddies are out there fighting against the enemy, getting shot at with arrows on the front line of the battle, and I'm resting and sleeping with my wife? No, I'll not do that. And he slept at the palace entrance along with the guard there. When David heard about it, verse 10, Uriah had gone, not gone home. He summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, the ark of the armies of, the, of Israel and Judah are in the tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How can I go home and wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. What a good man. Um, he's stronger than I would have been. <laughs> I would have been happy to go to my wife. Uh, but this man was a loyal soldier, dedicated man, and he said, no way I'm going to have fun while everybody else is in danger. I love my country. I'm going to fight for my country. I don't know why David pulled me home, but I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. So David tried again a second time, verse 12. Well then, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed um, in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. Uh-oh, he's still trying to cover up. He thought if the guy was drunk, uh, he would then go home. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go to his wife. Again, he slept in the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So David had a problem. It was going to be known that he had an adulterous affair with one of his best soldiers, one of his best friends, how could he do that? How could he do that to Uriah? He had no self-control. What kind of a man was he? He was a man after God's own heart. But he had a weakness. He had a besetting sin. He was a womanizer. He had ten wives. Wasn't that enough for him? Why did he have to take his best soldier, one of his best soldier's wife? Reminds me of Samson. Samson is called the he-man with a she problem. Had many women. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, the commander of his troops, and gave it to Uriah to deliver. That letter was going to condemn Uriah. He didn't read the letter. He folded it and stuck it in his pocket it was a private letter to the commander of his army, and he had no business reading it, and he didn't read it. In this letter, here's what it said. Verse 15, the letter instructed Joab, the commander of his troops, station Uriah on the front lines of the, where the battle is the fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. Uh-oh. So Joab assigned Uriah a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israeli soldiers. You see what's happening here? Joab got this note. He saw that King David was now guilty of murder. King David gave the order, and Joab followed it, put 
Uriah on the front line of the battle, secretly drew the troops back so that the man would be deliberately killed. When Nathan the prophet came to David to tell him, he poked his bony finger in David's chest and said, you killed Uriah with the sword of the sons of Ammon. You did it. You commanded that. You're responsible for his death. See what besetting sin does to you? When you don't look at where that sin is going, it's going to bring bad things into your life. You've got to learn to control. You've got to learn to get rid of that sin, no matter what it is. God sent Nathan to rebuke David, telling him a story that made him very angry. When Nathan the prophet came to him, he didn't just outright point his finger at him. He did it in a way that David would understand. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and one poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but his little lamb that he had brought, bought. He raised that little lamb and grew it up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from this cup and cuddled in his arm like a baby daughter. In those days, lambs could be like a domesticated pet, like we would have a pet cat or a pet dog. You could bring them into the house. Uh, they could eat from the table. Uh, sometimes they could even sleep at the feet of your bed or something like this. And uh, This was this man's case. Verse 4, one day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. What? A rich man had lots of animals? And he went and took this poor man who only had one little lamb that was his pet and killed and ate his lamb for his guest? David was furious, verse 5. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole uh, for having no pity. Then Nathan the, uh, said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and his kingdoms of, of Israel and Judah, and you had been enough. I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this terrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the swords of the sons of Ammon and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says, because of what you have done, I will curse your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes. He, uh, he will go in to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen. You open in the sight of Israel. When you sin, there are consequences to that. If you're in fellowship with God and you're fighting against that sin and God sees your weakness and he sees that it's a besetting sin for you and he sees that you, you pray, God, please help me. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, 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 I do this over and over. I don't really want to do it. I, I hate what I'm doing and I'm ashamed of it and it's a secret sin, but God, I'm weak and, and, and please help me. God sees your attitude and he sees that Satan has tricked you and beguiled you and and, you, and you're going in the wrong direction, but you're trying. You're trying to go in the right direction, and you're, you're struggling against it, and you're fighting against the sin. God has mercy on you. He's a God of mercy, a God of love, a God of compassion. But when you feel like you have a right to it, you feel like God has put this desire in you, why did God do this? Why did God give me this desire if it's not okay? God says, a potter makes a pot, and he makes it according to the way he wants to make it. I made you with a free will. You've got, you can do what you want. I'm not going to stop you. You're not a robot. You're not an animal. You've got a free will. You can choose what you do. You can learn to overcome your sins. Then, verse 13, David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. The law required when you did this, you must be executed. Many people don't believe in human execution, but God believes in it. God says if you kill somebody, your life must be taken. A lot of crime would stop because iniquity is not judged immediately. 
it's more and more and more sin. It's happening to America now. Unbelievable sins going on over there because criminals aren't punished anymore. Verse 14, nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the Lord by doing this, your child will die. That child died in a week later. David repented, and so much we. David's repentance is recorded in Psalm 51. This psalm was written, it's called a psalm of David regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Here's Psalm 51 where David records his repentance from his terrible sin of adultery and murder. Psalm 51.1, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out my sins. David knew that God was a God of mercy. It means that God has compassion. It means that he has a heart to forgive you. It means that he has a heart to love you. It means he wants the best for you. He's kind and gentle and loving and wants you to be like him. And David knew that. He knew that God was this kind of a God. He knew it from the book of Exodus. David had a copy of the Bible. He had the Old Testament. In Exodus 34, verse 5, the Lord God came down in a cloud and stood there with him and called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord. Uh, we say Jehovah today. Um, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren to the entire family as affected, even children to the third and fourth generations. Wow, what a statement. He's saying, your sins, your besetting sin, your anger in your home that's unjustified, your lust, whatever it is that you're doing, your children see it. God says, you're going to pass that on to the second and third generation. Is it God passing it along? I said, let's understand this. Passing the sins to the next generation happens because God does not take away free will. God gave us a free will, and when we continue to sin in the presence of our children, they learn from us, and their lives are lived like we live our life. We say in America, a chip off the old block. We say, like father, like son. Our children learn our ways. They are in our homes. They see our actions. They see our sins. They see our anger. They're fighting husband to wife, wife to husband. They learn from this. They become like us. That's how it's visited from generation to generation. God says you've got to learn self-control. You've got to learn how to conquer your sins. You've got to learn how to appropriate this power of the resurrection to overcome your sins so you're not demonstrating it to your children. God says it takes three or four generations for somebody to finally wake up and say, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, enough is enough. I've got to stop this. I'm going to be the one the generation that stops this besetting sin and you get close to God and you learn how to use the power of the resurrection of Christ to overcome that sin. You're affecting your, your descendants. You're teaching your children the way you are. Discipline yourself to use God's power to overcome the sin. So how is it possible for God to forgive sin when he's a God of justice. Justice means when somebody does something against you, it's unjust. They shouldn't do that. They steal something from you. I've had lots of things stolen from me. It's not right. It's not good. Whoever did that is guilty of stealing. How can God let them get away with that? How can God let us get away with what we're doing wrong? Because he puts our sins on Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.20, if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. 
For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Jesus Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor did he deceive anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he was suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins. Notice this. He personally, Jesus Christ personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. That's not talking about a physical healing. This is talking about a spiritual healing. We are dead in trespasses and sin. Our sins have killed us. Spiritually, we are dead. If you die in your sin, you cannot be in heaven with God. You are separated from God forever in the lake of fire with Satan. Jesus Christ took your punishment, my punishment, in his body on the tree. One man brought sin into the world, Adam. One man takes sin out of the world, Jesus Christ. All of the sins of Christians are put on Jesus Christ. He was dying on that cross for every sin I committed. He was dying for every sin you committed. You and I are murderers too. We killed Jesus Christ. Our sins put him there. Our sins punished him. Our sins caused that beating and the beer plucking and the spitting and the, and the nailing to the cross. We did it to him. Our sins did that to him. He was bearing our sins in his body. That's how God can forgive us. Because Jesus Christ took our punishment for us. He bore it out of love for us. We owe him. When a husband loves his wife, he's going to do what God says. God says, husbands, love your wife like Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. Men, husbands, you love your wife like that. You give yourself to her. You come home from work, you're tired. She's been working all day too. She's tired. You've got 25% more muscle structure than your wife. I told you before, and I'll say it again. On the way home from work, stop at the fruit stand. Get some fresh oranges. Go home, cut them in half, juice her a nice glass of orange juice, fresh orange juice. Call her, say, sweetheart, come and sit down for a while. Here's a glass of orange juice I brought for you. I've got, I've got you some chocolates as well. Have, have your cell phone ready because she might faint. You think, oh, no, and you've got to call an ambulance to sort of make sure she doesn't um, stay fainted. Treat her with love. Treat her. Learn to overcome your sin. Learn to be her best friend, and she will be your best friend. She won't have a headache when bedtime comes. She'll be a good friend for you. So David continued in verse 2 in Psalm 51. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. He now sees that what he's doing is wrong. Before Satan had tricked him, Satan had defiled, had, had um, sort of beguiled him and deceived him, and he thought he was justified in doing what he did to take Bathsheba, even though he had ten wives already. It tells us in the Bible that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand women. If you were to see Solomon, and he looked a little tired, you can understand why. One woman's enough to wear you out, but a thousand of them? Good night. I mean, this guy must really be quite a man to, to do all of that. So he says, I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. He had in his heart now a constant replay of what he did, and he felt very guilty. When you're caught doing something wrong, guilt floods over you and you feel very ashamed. Jesus Christ takes that guilt away from you. He bears our shame in his body as well because you're forgiven and cleansed. He says in verse 4, against you and you alone I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proven right when you say, and your judgment against me is just. 
The Jews considered any breaking of the law of God that you were really committing a sin against God. Yes, Bathsheba was sinned against, and yes, Uriah was sinned against, but the primary thing was he broke God's law. So against God's law, he sinned. He says in verse 5, I was born a sinner. Yes, from my mother's womb conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Here he's requesting God, I don't have the power in me to purify myself. I can't do it. You must purify me. You must make me pure from my sins. And then I'll be clean. Now I'm dirty. I've got sin in my heart. Wash me and I will be clean. God, you've got to wash me. That's what Jesus Christ does. He washes us from our sin. Verse 8, give me back my joy again, for you have broken me. Let me now rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my sin. Then David asked what we need to ask for. David asked for a new heart, a new creation. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart. David was saying, I've got a heart, but it's got dirt on it. It's a dirty heart. I need a new heart. I need something new being created in me. It's not in me now. My heart is not clean. It's not pure. It's, it's guilty. guilty. God, God, I need, I need you, you to create in me something, something new, something, something that's, that's not there, there now, now, a new creation. creation. When, when God, God spoke and created the earth, earth he just he spoke, let there be a universe, universe and automatically there were just, just like that, that, the whole universe created. God, David's saying, God, you're the creator, I'm the creature. I've got a dirty heart. You gave me a free will, and I made a mistake, two mistakes. I, I made many mistakes. My heart is not pure. I ask you, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart. When God does that for you or me, you then see it. The Bible tells you, keep yourself pure. You young people, your mom and dad, brought you up in the fear of the Lord if you came from a Christian home. They taught you, don't tell lies, don't steal, don't cheat. They taught you the right way. You came here, you were under their control at home. Now you're free. They can't see you, what you're doing. Grandma doesn't know what you're doing. How many times have I counseled with a young person from another country who made a mistake when mom's not looking? and went to bed with their boyfriend. How many young girls have had an abortion secretly that their mother and father wouldn't know what they've done? They killed their baby. Stay pure. Keep yourself pure. Don't don't let Satan deceive you by thinking you're missing out on something. If you have that strong a desire for a mate, then get married. That's what the Apostle Paul argues. If you've got this burning desire, it's better to marry than to burn. God says you can have all of the fun you want in bed as long as it's with your wife or your husband. It must stay there with, and nobody else. One husband and one wife together forever, they become one and you take, you can do anything you want that's not displeasing to the, to the two of you. You can have all, God intended it for pleasure. Some churches teach that procreation is that the sexual act in marriage is just for having babies. No, it's not. God gave it to us for pleasure as long as you keep it within the marriage. The poorest person on planet earth who's married can have just as much fun with a sexual relationship as the richest person. Money has nothing to do with it. If you love your husband and your wife loves you and you, you love each other and what you're doing in the bedroom is private and your own business, you can have all the fun you want for as long as you want. And God is pleased with that. You're not defiling anything. But when you get out of the marriage context, you're in sin. If you do it in your heart by watching pornography, you're in sin. You cannot lust after other people. Satan is deceiving you. What you're seeing on that screen is going to come into your mind and heart, and you're going to start accepting that as normal, and you're going to, you're going to fall. How many preachers have we 
have we had today who fell in sin this way because pornography ruined them? You think it's normal? Satan tells you, you've got these desires too. Stay away from it. Keep yourself pure. Love God. Love your wife. Love your family. Fight against your sins. Learn to control yourself. The fruit of the Spirit, the last one is self-control. David was miserable. He had no joy until God gave him power to overcome his sin. Verse 13, he says, Then, after I get forgiven and cleansed, I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you, and do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. We're all guilty. We all have what is called the besetting sin. The besetting sin is one that you can't get victory over. You do it again and again and again, and you're miserable. You're saying, God, what's wrong with me? Why can't I conquer this? Satan has deceived you. You think you're getting benefit from that, but you're not. You are dooming yourself. You are coming under the judgment of God. You don't have joy. You feel guilty. Your children, if you have them, are going to learn from you. You're going to pass it to the next generation. You've got to learn to control. You've got to learn to walk with God. You've got to learn to be pure and keep yourself pure. You're moving in the right direction when you're trying that. I'll conclude now. My time's gone with James chapter 4, starting in verse 4. He calls us adulterers. Maybe in your case it's heart adultery. You're looking at the bathing woman with all of her beauty, and you're lusting for her. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the Scripture mean when they say uh, what um, the Spirit of God's place within us is filled with envy? But he gives us more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the Scripture said, God opposes the proud but favors the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You need the power of God to resist him. I want to tell you about that next week. Please don't be late. Come. Verse 8, come close to God. Look at this promise. You make it your business. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. When you sit in, your, in front of your Bible, and you open it, and it's private between you and God, and you open the Bible, and you're reading God's Word, Jesus said, now are you clean through the words I have spoken to you. You open up about Jesus Christ, and you read something Jesus did, something he said, and, and you feel clean. You feel God's Spirit cleaning your heart, and you say, God, I want to draw close to you, God. I, I need your presence. I need to feel you, God. Please, you promise if I draw close to you, you'll draw close to me. God, please forgive me for my besetting sin. Please forgive me for my sins. Lord, I've got, I've, got a, I've got a sinful heart, God. I need a new heart. God, help me. And God does it. He's compassionate and forgiving and kind and good and loving. And he comes close to you. And you can feel his presence. You can feel his love. Walk in his steps. Be like him. Verse 8, come close to God. He will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Don't rejoice that you have sin. Hate it. That's why I gave you this memory verse today. 
Psalm 97, 10, you that love the Lord hate evil. You've got to see the besetting sin that you've got is evil. You've got to hate it. Psalm 97, 10, you that love the Lord hate evil. Psalm 97, 10, learn that and humble yourself. We're just human, but God who is holy is willing to be our friend. He's willing to help us. He's willing to forgive us. He's merciful. He's kind. He loves us. Love him enough to learn self-control. Love him enough to love him more than you love your besetting sin. Which he, Paul said, I've got a sin problem. I'm covetous. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. There's a power in the resurrection that you need to know about to overcome your besetting sin. Let's learn about it next week, okay? My time's gone now. Let's stand for the final prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the truths we read in your holy word. Lord, we all stand guilty before you of besetting sin, of sins that we don't have self-control over. But Lord, we want to learn. Dear Jesus, we want to learn from you. You said, come to me, take my yoke and learn from me. Come, take and learn. We want to come to you, dear Lord Jesus. We want to take your yoke. We want to learn from you. You're a great teacher. We want to know the power of the resurrection. Lord, we, we confess that we failed you in so many ways. Please forgive us and cleanse us from our besetting sins. And Father, if there's any here among us or listening on the internet that have not yet received you as Savior, I pray, Lord, that you will um, speak to their heart now as only you can, that they might right this minute believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can be saved. He's the only Savior. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12 tells us. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and Christians are praying for you. Are you willing to receive Christ as your Savior and be forgiven for your sins? God says if you believe in your heart, best you can about Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9. And he says in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You call on the Lord with a little prayer from a believing heart, and he will forgive you and save your soul. I'm going to say the sinner's prayer, and if you have never yet received Christ as your Savior, you can whisper this little prayer out because he says, with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So whisper this prayer out if you wish, if you haven't done so already. It's a prayer to ask God to forgive you because you believe in Jesus. Here we go. Pray, dear Father, I believe in Jesus' death burial and resurrection best that I can by faith. I ask you, please forgive me for my sins. I want to receive Christ as my Savior. Thank you, dear Father. Christians, if you have said this prayer and you're already saved, then ask the Lord to give you a clean, pure heart. Ask him to teach you how to overcome besetting sin. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of your young Christians here. Help us all, Lord. We, we need to be close to you. We need your power over sin. Please give us this power. We thank you in Jesus' dear name. Amen.